Hello, dear viewers. Welcome to today's women's show on the Civics Space TV. I am your host for today, Chirabo Marion, and the topic of today is the Human Rights Commission 2022. To help us dissect this 100 pages document are my lovely panelists, and I will let them introduce themselves. Yes. Good morning, our viewers. My mm -hmm. name is Diana Campereza. I work with the Uganda Human Rights Commission as a human rights officer mm. in the Directorate of Monitoring and Inspections. Mm. And I'm really glad to be here this morning. We are happy to have you Thank today. You. Thank you. Yes. Hello, viewers. I'm Zahara Nampio. Mm -hmm. uh, I teach at the School of Law, Mackay University. I'm also the director for the Human Rights and Peace Centre, which is part of the School of Law. Pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have you too. So today's topic is the Human Rights Report. Um, as you all know, it really centers around the events of 2021 and how really human rights of Ugandans were treated during that time. We all know that 2021 was a turbulent time. It was out of this world. We had a lockdown. We had a pandemic. We had an election. There's so many things that are packed up in this one year. But I would just like us to, get, what are the highlights for you in this report? What, what, what is that that you think really clicked for you? Diana, what, what do you think? Um, thank you very much. But uh, Chirawa, before I go into yeah. uh, speaking to what the report is all about, yeah. just allow me to speak briefly about the commission. Okay. That is the Uganda Human Rights Commission, which is mm. a constitutional mm. body mm. that is mandated to protect and promote human rights of yes. all persons in the country. Sorry. Mm. The uh, commission is um, uh, has five directorates, and one of the directorates is monitoring and inspections, uh, which is in charge of ensuring that the human rights situation is monitored, yes. and a report is submitted to parliament. Yes. We have a directorate of complaints, uh, investigations, and legal services mm. that is in charge of receiving complaints, and also the tribunal function of the commission. We also have a directorate of research documentation that is in charge of research, then the one for finance and administration, and also the one for regional services that coordinates uh, work of head office with the regions. Mm. So that's how the, and of course we have our bosses, the commissioners mm. and the chairperson mm. and the secretary. Mm. So <clears throat> the broad mandate, as you well know, mm. or as you may know, uh, is to protect and promote human rights of all persons mm. in the country. Mm. And in 2021, we launched a report and uh, it had different uh, issues that we are discussing as a commission. We looked at the human rights implications uh, that were caused by COVID mm. and the lockdowns and all that that came along with uh, COVID-19. We looked at the extractive industries okay. and the human rights implications. Mm. And we focused on Karamoja region. Okay. We looked at teenage pregnancies mm. and of course the effects and the human rights implications okay. that comes along. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> we looked at um, islands, Buvuma mm. Island, Kalangala, Island and the human rights implications there. We looked at the rights of refugees, the urban refugees, we focused on them this time round, mm. and so many other things. Mm. Um, and the traditional mm. chapters mm. of mm. receiving complaints, Yes. Uh, the one for monitoring places of detention, mm. juvenile justice, and so many other issues yes, really yes, that yes. we uh, talked about as a commission. Mm. Yeah, but for, yes, it's a whole, it's a whole lot of topics. Mm. But for today, and for the fact that, that we have so limited time, mm. I think I think we would dive into certain uh, topics, especially what is specific to us. Of, of course, everything affects women. Mm. Um, but I think we will go to the highlights, and perhaps I will start with the um, 2021 pandemic and mm. COVID and the implications of COVID-19, mm. starting with um, teenage pregnancies. Mm. And um, the report recently um, highlighted that one out of four girls aged 15 to 19 mm. got pregnant during the pandemic. Yes. And I think the thing on people's minds is how did schools become safer than the homes. You would expect where my parents are, where my relatives are, I ought to be safe. Mm. Why are homes not safe for girls, mm. for young girls? Mm. Of course, uh, we all used to think that really our homes are safer yeah, yeah. than the schools. Yeah. But during the pandemic, we noted that many girls got pregnant. Mm. There's a, 
a high range of, 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 of women, of girls that really got yes. pregnant. And uh, one of the issues that we found out is that as we were in the lockdown, mm. people wanted to explore. People were idle. Mm. The children were idle. Mm. And the only thing they would do besides the domestic work that they were uh, engaging themselves in mm. was to go and explore. And that's how many of them really got pregnant. Mm. Mm. Being idle, mm. keeping home, and they wanted to explore. And of course at school, they are preoccupied with so many uh, mm. activities mm. while in school. They, they are engaged in school activities. So they really do not have time to uh, go into those other mm. issues or those other uh, mm. relations mm. that end up, uh, that all uh, make them really end up getting pregnant. But, but is it to say that because we only started recently going to school as 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 this generation, I, are we saying that in the past, in our let me say, parents and maybe grandparents generation, they they were idle because they didn't go to school. Most of our no. grandparents, of and, course. So what has changed? That what you has know, changed is that really also technology has has um, <coughs> influenced because people now know what. We never used to know when we were younger. Mm. You would you would be surprised if you asked a P4 uh, child mm. what sex is, and they explain whatever, mm. everything was having sex. Mm. So there's a lot of exposure. Mm. Technology has is both good and bad. Okay. okay. In regards to uh, information, the information that is out there is mm. sometimes not really good for the young children. Okay. And when they see the information, when they get the information, they want, they, to, they, they want to know what is <laughs> yes. really, mm. the, what is this that I'm reading mm. about? Yeah. Mm. Dr. Zahara, what do you think? What, what, what is it really about this whole teenage pregnancy? Because mm. year in, year out, only that uh, 2021 was a bit too much and excessive. But mm. year in, year out, the issue of teenage pregnancies, we have these campaigns, we go to all, all, all parts of the country, mm. teenage pregnancy. Why haven't we been able to find a long-lasting solution? Mm. Thank you very much, Marion. Um, allow me to start by uh, giving a quote by Eleanor Roosevelt. Mm. Eleanor Roosevelt was first lady of the United States yes. in the mid-1940s. Um, she was actually at the helm of drafting the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Yes. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt, um, when talking about human rights generally and the significance of rights, she said that uh, where, after all, do universal human rights begin? Yes. And she says that human rights begin in small places close to to home yeah so close and so small that they cannot be seen on any maps of the world mm. and she says that um, without concerned citizen action yes to uphold these rights close to home mm. we shall look in vain for progress yeah. in the larger world yeah so she emphasizes the point that rights begin at home mm. we may talk about the right to education mm. the right to health care but mm. if these rights are not being respected mm. in the smallest unit of society, which is the mm. home, then we won't have any rights at all. Mm. And I think I can relate this to the issue of the high teenage pregnancies during COVID. Mm. The family is no longer that unit that provides security, uh, support, social mm. support, mm. and care that the way it used to be. Mm. Um, and I think many things have happened to change that. During the COVID, of course, um, our children were at home. Yeah. Uh, there, was no, there was no going to school. So uh, of course they were in this social setting. Uh, but unfortunately, the mothers who used to be at home um, have now gone into informal work. Yes. Um, many, in many homes, the women are involved in the informal work yes. sector. Yes. The men are in the formal. Yes. So during the COVID, during the lockdown, the women continued to work in the markets, to yeah. work in different places. So they were not in the house. Yeah. The men, on the other hand, were there at home because they were not in their formal settings. Yes, yes. So you are having a situation of children, young girls at home with uncles, with elder brothers, uh, with neighbors, mm. neighbors' sons. So it, it was a situation where the social controls in the family were no longer holding. 
the mothers were missing. Mm. But of course, that's not to say that it is the responsibility of the mothers yes. to look after the, the children yes. alone. Of course, it has to be something that uh, comes together. Mm. But I think uh, the situation of security at home and safety, mm. which made the girls vulnerable, also goes to talk about many other things that were prevalent during that time in, mm. in the COVID period. Mm. The, the lack of access to healthcare, for example. Mm, mm. Uh, many of our young children mm. are sexually exposed, but mm. they were not able to access uh, sexual and productive health services mm. because of the lockdown, because of the distances, mm. you know, to the healthcare uh, settings. Mm. So, of course, uh, this th there is a lot of interrelatedness of issues and rights. Yes. The fact that you're not going to school, yes. but you're not able to access healthcare. Mm. There's so much information mm. going around, the lack of, of control within mm. the family. All those issues made children more vulnerable. And not only the, the girls who mm. ended up getting pregnant, but there were also the boys mm. who were exposed in settings where, you know, uh, workers are exposing the young boys to mm. sexual relations and, and all these things that come with it. So mm. it's a whole mix, it's a basket, yes, yes. both for girls as well and as for, for boys. boys. Mm. Yes, yes, yes. yes. But then when we're looking at how, how now how do we move on from this? You know, um, recently we're talking about now that the schools are open, taking the girls back to school. Mm. And we're also talking about pers uh, p uh, prosecution of some of these defilement, because they are defilement cases. And we haven't really seen much of that. I haven't heard of any, um, or, or uh, maybe it's the media that is not reporting, mm. you know. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the Human Rights Commission protecting and promoting human rights. Do you know of any cases that have been persecuted, for example? But also, what are we doing to help these girls as they're going back to school? Is there any, any strategy that the Human Rights Commission has done? Um, <clears throat> as a Human Rights Commission, I earlier noted that we have a directorate that is in charge of research yes. and documentation. And this uh, directorate basically uh, also does community engagements, community awareness yes. programs. So it has designed uh, different programs that focus uh, most especially on those areas or those places that had high prevalence of uh, teenage pregnancies mm. and they are carrying out uh, civic education mm. or awareness creation on, 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 on rights. And of course, uh, one of the, of the things that we are looking out for is to reach out to the parents, to reach okay. out to, 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 to the uh, fathers and see how they can protect such children yes. uh, uh, while under their care. Yes. Mm. Have you seen any progress in that line? Yes, of course there is progress, uh, though it may not really be seen that uh, today I went to this place, I, I carried out community sensitization and this happened. Yes. But we believe that with time, mm. uh, things will positively change. Mm. Uh, Doctor, yeah. has there been any progress in the persecution of some of these? Have you taken some cases to court mm. and say that, ah, this one, at least we, we, we put all our energies on this one and the perpetrator mm. was punished. Mm. Oh, mm. government at we am. Mm. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's uh, all these things are, are sort of connected. They are mm. interrelated. Um, number one, um, during the COVID period, there was a general lock, lockdown. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, because of the travel restrictions, even reporting cases to the police became a problem mm. in case, you know, someone's mm. child was defiled. Mm. Um, even um, the courts mm. were closed. Yes, so yes. even if cases managed to get there, yeah. the process of justice yeah. was slower. But uh, let me also say that um, one other underlying factor to all this is the poverty. Many times a family will get into a situation where a, a young girl has been impregnated by a, a, a neighbor's son mm. and it will become a process of negotiation. Mm. Yeah, so yeah. yes, the girl is pregnant. Yeah. She won't be able to go back to school. What mm. is it that you can do for us? Mm. So many of the cases die mm. at that level. It is a criminal offense. Defilement is a criminal offense. But the cases end up dying because, you know, people are so poor down yes, there yes, yes. that even the process of accessing justice yeah. 
becomes hectic and uh, and and expensive mm. and people weigh the odds and say mm. okay if someone is willing to look after my child until they can give yes, birth and yes. then maybe she can go back to school yes. or they can get married mm. so uh, really i just want to also emphasize the fact that we can't look at these things piecemeal yeah and say that you know how do we protect this young girl mm. because this young girl is part of a society yes where her parents have to, you know, weigh the odds mm. and say, how do we deal with this situation? Mm. So there are issues of rights involved. There are neighbors' sons involved in all of this. So it's it's really an issue. Mm. So um, I think that the way we need to deal with this is to look at society generally and the human mm. rights that are involved. Mm. Because it has to be holistic. Yes. It has to be interconnected and indivisible. Mm. People have to uh, continue surviving. Yes. Um, how do we, if this girl is willing to go back to school in that early stage, how do we protect her? Mm. We've had cases reported in the media where these girls have gone to school. And they're being and shut Yes, mm. and no, mm. they're being called judges, mm. you know, mm. because their bellies are starting to swell. Yes. How do we prepare the community? Yeah, how have we prepared? Mm. The, yes, we have a policy by the Ministry of Education to allow mm. pregnant girls to continue with school. Mm. But the, the stigma that happens in the school environment yeah. from their peers is so yeah. bad yeah. that they would rather stay home. Mm. Yeah. So how can they be supported? How do we prepare our societies? Mm. We've had his headmasters, head teachers, yes. who have sent girls back home. Yeah. Mm. So there are so many things yeah. that we have to deal with. You know, the community awareness, we need research and empirical yeah. data to know how prevalent is the problem, mm. where do we start from. Mm. Um, there are also other very touchy issues. Yeah. If the, yeah, the young girl has to have this child, what kind of support mechanism is there mm. in our societies? Mm. So it's about a holistic approach to human mm. rights, I think. Do our hospitals have that, uh, that care, the mm. health services, for this young girl to go and give birth? Remember, she's 14, she's 15. Mm. Her body is not uh, you know, biologically ready to yeah, have a child. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she's possibly going to require a caesarean section. Yes. How many theaters down there in Iganga, in Bujiri, do we have that are going to be able to accommodate this? Mm. Mm. Because remember, Alo says she cannot terminate the pregnancy. So mm. can she carry and it's a fairly risky pregnancy? Mm. Is the system going to be able to support her? So we need to look at these things holistically. The government needs to come in and say, okay, these young girls, are they able to go to school? Are the hospitals available? Are there social systems, you know, for these young babies who are going to be born? Mm. So many things we have to mm. think about as a mm. country. And maybe just to, because the, the, and around the schools issue, those debates came up, especially when um, the churches that really mm. own some of these schools were like, there is no way we can allow this pregnant girl, she's going to corrupt others, and we, uh, and how will we take care of the baby? Mm. We have no baby uh, centers. centers. Mm. But then there is the human rights position, uh, position of, and rights of um, every person should have a right to education. Yes. Mm. You know, mm. whether they can afford it or not, that should be up to them, but they should be able to go into a classroom and access mm. um, basic education. Mm. So, how, uh, when we're talking about the Human Rights Commission, but also people in advocacy, human rights, is there any way that you could take or sue some of these schools for? Um, not allowing you to access your right of education or are the girls left to eh, to whom it may concern God, God God is the only one who can save mm -hmm. us how do we create some some legal safeguard so that we can kind of mitigate uh, the harsh reaction of society towards these girls and the stigma that comes with teenage mm -hmm. pregnancy mm -hmm. Um, well, of course, there is hierarchy of laws. Yeah. Ideally, the laws by the government, um, you know, should supersede the yeah. other systems and codes yeah. of faith institutions, for example. Yeah. Um, so a Ministry of Education policy that a, a pregnant girl yeah. should go back to school should really be the dominant one. Yeah. But of course, we shouldn't forget about uh, the, the power centers, if it is a you know, a Christian school yeah. and they have their own rules. Mm. Mm. Uh, those also happen. That's mm. why I think it's a big, it's a bargaining process. Yeah. Um, of course, the government needs to, you know, be strict about this with the schools and yeah. say, 
this is this is how the position should be but um, i think it's not enough to have this girl in school yeah. without a supportive school yeah. environment without a supportive uh without the, the peers also supporting yeah so it has to be a combination of factors mm. um it, it would be good for example for a civil society organization to take up a, a mm. test case mm. for a girl who has for example been expelled from school just mm. to test our jurisprudence and and have a clear you know pronunciation by the courts to say that these girls should stay in school because of this and the other um and i think maybe that's a challenge that we throw back to ourselves okay yeah but it would be it would be a good thing because we know yes the law supersedes but i yeah. i think we need that affirmation yeah that it from, it's from the actually courts, does. Yes. okay mm. so then back to you and uh, to something that has been really on the ramp uh, rampage I remember recently when I was traveling I reached the airport and there was this line of so many Ugandan women going mm. to Qatar they were dressed in veils it was kind of a black uniform all of them I kept on asking I asked one are you a muslim are you mm. going where are you going for and they were telling me they were going to work mm. and the human rights report shows <coughs> that uh, um out of the one thousand immigrant workers only 0.2% are actually professional jobs mm -hmm. even when the advertising they tell you uh, if you have let me say expertise let me say if you are a banker mm -hmm. or if you are a nurse and they only advertise professional jobs but you and I know that most of the people who go are and uneducated mm -hmm. and pro possibly if they have a level of educated it's, it's a basic let me say p4 drop out mm -hmm. perhaps they don't even know basic english you know so what are the challenges within there but also the exploitation of workers uh the fact that we have had reports of immigrant workers going and they are mistreated some of them come without organs mm -hmm. you know and they come back and they have nothing to show for all the work mm -hmm. they've been mm -hmm. so dive us into that particular aspect of the human rights commission what you found out but also what would be the way forward on how we can protect immigrant workers because like it or not at least when it comes to the foreign exchange most of um, there's a big contribution that dia diaspora mm. Ugandans in the diaspora have to our foreign exchange so they ought to be protected because they contribute to the economy mm. don't you think True. so yeah um thank you very much and of course that was also one of our I think most interesting chapters yeah, yeah. Uh, because it really touches our people it really touches it is evident like we've seen these things uh in the media we've seen um girls and boys going for better uh, employment opportunities and of course all that comes mm. it has push mm. and pull factors mm. and where people um they are looking for for employment mm. we all know that our employment sector cannot really accommodate all of us okay mm. so people have sure. to really um go out to look for better jobs yeah. and we also take note of the fact that uh, there are better wages out there mm. and considering the fact that we do not have a minimum wage in uganda yes. maybe if we had one mm. and you know i'm working as a housemaid i'm paid this maybe uh the, they wouldn't really be moving out of the country so 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 much but the fact that we don't have a minimum wage people have to move for mm. better wages and uh, <clears throat> the push factors of course we know the poverty levels in the yeah. country are really high and employment mm. and employment you find one is uh, um, maybe a, prof, uh, a, a qualified teacher but she or she's working like in a factory like maybe a cleaner <laughs> yeah. uh, we uh, and and of course the low wages that i talked about mm. that really make people move out of the country mm. Now, <clears throat> the human rights issues that we found out. Yes. You've already actually mentioned most of them. Organ mm. harvesting. Yes. Um, we noted that most girls go, actually, most people that go out are young people. Mm. They are in their prime prior years. Yeah, yeah, years, right? years. And their organs are really fit. They are okay. Mm. Mm. So when they go out there, you find they're taking advantage of them and they are taking their organs with mm. or without actually without their consent yeah. mm. we've um 
found out that some people go there and they are, they, they are, their passports are confiscated. You don't know yes. where your passport mm. is. So you can really be tortured. You can be used in any way because you do not have a way out. Even mm. if you want to run, you do not have where to run. How do you mm. go from, from such countries that, that you're running to, come back to, to Uganda without a passport? Yes. We've seen where people have not been paid. Mm. They go out to work, but they are not paid mm. for all that time. Mm. Wasted time, you go out of the country, but you find you're not really being paid. Mm. And also we found uh, where they divert, as you said, they go as uh, professionals. You, 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 you've been recruited as a teacher or as a nurse, but you find you're working in a very different environment. Yes. So there's diversion of, of, uh, mm. of the roles or the... the, the the work that you that you you, uh, you that you do out there, mm. and uh, <clears throat> another interesting thing was uh, let me just uh, uh, refer to my um, the issue of language barrier because if you take note of the people that move out, most of them are actually they are not really qualified if I can say or they are mm. they have uh, maybe like up to senior four level and. Uh, Sometimes they, 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 you might find that they started from our village schools, which sometimes people really do not know English or cannot really express themselves. So when they reach out there, it's really hard for them to communicate. And also some do not know Arabic. And you know most of those mm -hmm. countries use Arabic. Mm -hmm. So you find there's a, a mismatch somewhere. Mm -hmm. And of course, the, our cultures differ mm -hmm. from them. There's a scenario where um, <clears throat> a girl, you know, like in Buganda, if someone kneels, it's appreciation, it's greeting, mm. it's something. But when you kneel out there in 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 in, uh, um, in uh, one countries. of those countries, yeah. when you kneel, it shows that you're disrespecting. Not disrespecting, but you're like if you kneel yeah. before a man. You're inviting him or him mm. to oh. a sexual encounter, mm. Mm. Wow, and I so one 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 day a girl knelt to show just respect, and of course the woman in the house was offended, beat up mm. the girl. How do you kneel before my husband? Mm. You know, uh, the issue of cultural yeah. differences mm. is also really, mm. um, really really high, and mm. it really, um, it's not really. Um, a good mm, thing, mm. Uh, and most most especially, some girls are not, uh, they are not taught or they are not oriented. Mm. You know, mm. they are not oriented on what you're likely to find out there. Mm. So you find you go and it really hits you so hard because you don't know the cultures of those people. As you said, most of them are not Muslims, but mm -hmm. they put on those veils, mm. so that they fit in, but mm. they do not know. The, the, the Muslim yeah, way yeah, of yeah. life. Mm. They do not know how to conduct themselves as Muslims. Well, they're not so, even oriented. Uh, exactly. Mm. So, uh, <clears throat> and we take note of the fact that I think Uganda has agreements with, I think, three countries. Mm. Uh, um, that is uh, Saudi Arabia, Jordan. Saudi Arabia, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and United Arab Emirates. Mm. So the other countries where they are going, they do not have agreements with mm. Uganda, so they can be treated in any way. That, but even yeah. the ones that they have agreements with, have has there been <coughs> any difference? Um, at least those with agreements. Yes, of course. The, there are also human rights issues there. Mm -hmm. mm. There are also we are also experiencing torture and all those things. Mm. But at least if you have an agreement, mm. then you have a starting point. Mm. You know, as a government, you know, okay, have an agreement with this. So if there's anything, I can go for mm. and take action. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. But then also in your report, because I am, we are quite curious. Why, why do these Arab countries really, whereas other countries are chasing immigrants away from their country, why are these Arab countries so interested in foreign labor, especially African foreign labor? Mm. I guess that it's cheap. Yeah, it's but, cheap, but definitely. But most people are saying, you know, jobs. We don't have jobs as ourselves citizens. Why, mm. why, why are you bringing in? We have seen the cases of South Africa even here in, 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 in Africa. Mm. We've seen in Italy and in Europe, generally people are being pushed out. Mm. Maybe, doctor, you could give us an insight. Mm. Is there a particular reason why Arab countries mm. are keeping on taking in this, this cheap labor? Mm. Maybe that might be, give us a clue to why. Mm. Um, 
Of course, uh, number one is that the, the labor mm. provided by Uganda is cheaper. Yeah. Mm. I think as a country, um, well, compared to countries like Philippines, for example, yeah. Philippines, the, the rate will be higher. But I think it also comes from our bargaining, negotiating power mm. through our recruitment agencies. Mm. Um, as you know, we now have the externalization regulations of 2005. So it is government policy that we can export labor okay. as, a, as a strategy, yeah. um, which is not a bad thing. Yeah. It's not a bad thing for, to create opportunities for mm. Ugandans. Yeah. Uh, but the issue is, um, as we are creating these opportunities, the government should also be bargaining for a better package. Generally, um, out there, um, um, I believe or I've heard that uh, the, you, the rate of Ugandans, uh, you know, Ugandan labor is actually cheaper than other countries, especially, you know, like Philippines used to be a, a labor exporting country, yes. but uh, Uganda will get it much, much cheaper. Yeah. And of course, there are other human rights issues that come with this. Mm -hmm. um, the age, mm -hmm. so it's uh, ex exclusionary. You know, they will specify that they want young women between the ages of 20 to 45. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so it leaves out a certain age bracket of or maybe a younger person or an mm -hmm. older person mm -hmm. who would have wanted to provide that. And then if we talk about women, you know, then they always require the pregnancy test. Mm -hmm. They always mm. require an HIV test. Mm. So there are other human rights implications. So what happens when you're going to work? What mm. happens to your other human rights, for example? So of course, those are things that um, we need to think about. Um, and the places that we are sending these young men and women to as a country, yes, it is a strategy. But as uh, Diana mentioned, we mm. don't have bilateral agreements with all the countries yes. in the Middle East where our mm. people are going, Oman and, and wherever. We only have three bilaterals. And even then, we have them on paper. Enforcement is not as good because um, it talks about providing contracts, paying on time, good conditions of work, um, good conditions of work. But then, uh, you know, all these things in terms of the enforcement become, um, become difficult. Then, of course, uh, if you're looking at women, women-specific, mm. Um, the, the work that women are doing, domestic mm. workers, they are in the private sphere mm. where monitoring becomes difficult. Mm. Mm. Um, so all those human rights issues that come with that. Let me stop you right there because mm. right now we're going for a break, but we will continue the conversation when we get back. Thank you so much. Digital rights are those human rights and legal rights that allow individuals to access, use, create and publish digital media or to access and use computers, other electronic devices and telecommunication networks. Digital rights include a right to freedom of expression, information and communication through technology, a right to privacy and data protection, a right to credit for personal works, a right to universal and equal digital access, a right to identity, a right to anonymity, a right to be forgotten and a right for protection of minors among others. The state's digital rights are frequently violated through various unfair actions, for example, blockage of websites and social networks, theft of credentials, unauthorized use of people's data for personal gain, privacy intrusion, online censorship, arrests and intimidation of online users, internet blockages, and a proliferation of laws and regulations that undermine the potential of technology to drive social, economic, and political development worldwide. It is hence every citizen's responsibility to respect rights of other digital users and to speak out or report to the responsible parties when one's rights are violated. Hello everyone, welcome back to the break. We'll continue from where we started. We were talking about immigrants and how they've been treated badly in the Middle Eastern countries and how that affects um, their human rights. And we were still with Dr. Zahara. You are mm. still explaining to us um, mm. the bilateral agreements that yeah. we have, how they are not effective. Yeah. Mm. Thank you very much, Marion. So, yes, we do have these bilateral agreements mm. uh, between the government of Uganda and the receiving countries. Mm. Uh, and they are fairly well detailed. Mm. But I think um, the problem comes from the fact that, especially the, the young women that go into the labor market mm. in the Middle East, go into the private sphere. Yeah. the mm. homes, mm. which are outside of the monitoring of the state. Mm. 
um, unlike the men who you know do security work yes, and other yes. jobs where they uh, don't stay in the homes mm. so the homes are fairly closed and that creates a problem so the the young women are more vulnerable to issues such as overwork mm. uh, confiscation of passports mm. and phones mm. Uh, inadequate uh, sleep mm. and, and, and food. Mm. I was talking to a young woman who came back and she told me that at a certain point she had to steal food from the refrigerator, including surviving on green pepper, you know, the, the oh, green pepper. God. Sometimes they would be so hungry and have to eat the food mm. left over from their employers. Mm. So the fact that many of our young women are doing this domestic work leaves them outside of the enforcement mm. uh, of the bilateral agreements. Mm. Um, and I think we also need to, to note the fact that uh, whereas our government of Uganda has focused on this as a strategy to create opportunities, many of these countries have not signed the international labor uh, organization mm. agreements mm. and conventions, mm. which create a minimum level of standards of work. Mm. So if you're sending your citizens to a country that hasn't signed you know, the minimum ILO conventions, mm. That means that, you know, they are not bound by inter any international standards. Mm. Um, of course, ourselves as Uganda, we haven't ratified the ILO agreement number mm. 89, which is on uh, treatment of domestic workers, you know, minimum mm. standards of treatment of domestic workers, okay. even us here internally. Mm. Mm. So, but even where we are sending our people, they, do, they are not bound by these international standards. Mm. What can we do? Yes, we can continue to sign the bilaterals, I think we also need to set an agreement uh, or a condition and say, if we are to send our citizens to your country, at least as a starting point, ratify these international treaties. Because then there is a process by which these countries can be held accountable. Mm. Uh, we don't have many embassies in this Middle East. I think we only have in Saudi Arabia. Uh, so that means that even our government representation is very thin mm. at that point. So where do our people go in case of mm. problems, you know? So we need at least some labor attaches, you know, in different countries. But we also need gender attaches. Mm. People are going to be able to respond quickly to issues of sexual and gender-based violence, mm. you know, when, when our citizens need to reach out to them. Mm. So as a country, we need to uh, see how we can improve mm. uh, the conditions of work of our people mm. as we promote this as a strategy going forward. Mm. Why haven't we not um, ratified the domestic um, workers, um, um, what did you call it? Yeah, uh, the Convention 89. I, I think the is Uganda Human Rights Commission is doing a good job uh, at identifying all these treaties. Mm. Uh, yes. <laughs> is there a reason? Is there a reason? Oh, it's something that we just skipped our minds uh -huh. then. No, it's, there's no reason. But of course, you know, that is the work of the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Okay to uh, look at these international instruments mm. and, uh, and, and ratify them. Okay. So as a commission, what we do, we keep uh, advocating for okay. them to be ratified. Mm. We use our platforms to ensure that these other conventions that are not yet ratified mm. and that are relevant and very important to our country, mm. we, uh, we engage with the, with the different stakeholders to ensure that they are I was considered. thinking it was because some of them know how they treat <laughs> their own workers at home. Yeah, so enough. someone would not want to ratify something yeah, that would enough. come for that's them true, first. That's true. Mm. But, but back to you, Doctor. Of course, we all know that as African countries, we have a weak bargaining um, um, power mm. on the international scene. So is there uh, maybe any remedies as how maybe East Africa as a whole, because I've also seen Kenya is suffering from the same mm, thing, you know, mm, but mm. I think I saw a BBC documentary. Mm. And so is there an East African solution, an AU solution? Because mm. it can't be only Ugandans that are going. It must be cheap labor mm. all across the mm. African. So have there been any interventions of those big regional bodies so that, you know, you bargain as a bloc? Mm. Yeah, that, that's true. Although in my view, mm. this is a short-term strategy. You can't immunize, educate, mentor, and leave your adults to just leave the country to go and provide labor elsewhere. I think this is a short-term strategy. I think as a country, we need to become inward-looking, yeah. maybe also as a region, mm. and create opportunities. Because people are leaving to go and provide this labor, to go and work involuntarily it's yeah. not out of choice yeah um actually when you talk to some of the returnees 
they come back here uh, after about a year or so they 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 return even knowing the conditions mm. there they return because the opportunities here they, they say oh, i'd rather have something in the pocket yeah, than, than stay have here and, and have nothing so we need to create opportunities back home so the externalization of labor is just a, a temporary strategy i think we need to find something that's more long lasting mm, mm, for mm. our own country mm. Mm. So Diana, your report does talk about, um, of course, 2021, like I said, was a whole cocktail of, of things. And one of the things that stood out is that we had elections. Not to say that that was the start of all our problems, but yes, it kind of, there's a way that they escalated things further. Yeah. And your report, correct me if I'm wrong, talked about, about, <laughs> Um, 600 arrests around there. Correct me if the numbers are not... What were the numbers? Um, but let us just put it that the, the, the arrests were in a hundred. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. people who disappeared are in hundreds of people who disappeared. We have <coughs> reports of torture, including the most recent ones being, um, I think, a new piece of reporter from Kasese, uh, that really was badly beaten and the, uh, the scars all over mm. him and, you know, in very um, private places. And then we had Alexandria. Um, she was also a new mobilizer. As it was sexual assault and torture, you know. And these are not the only, these are just the most recent. Uh, ever since 2021, these reports have mm. come up. People are still looking for their missing relatives. There was even a BBC report where we saw, um, actually for them, they got the CCT cameras somehow. I don't know how they were able to get the footage, but um, the military and police just shooting into people who mm. are just minding their own business and going about their work. So there were a lot of gross human rights abuses, um, killings of people, and uh, torture disappearances of people. Tell us more about that. Why, 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 of course, the politics were in play, but is there a deeper reason? Is there a deeper reason why we are in this situation that we are in? But also, what is the Human Rights Commission doing to address some of these violations? Should, because we, most people feel like it has now become normal. Torture has become normal. We are no longer shocked when we see someone claim that they were they disappeared and they were tortured. Mm. I mean, even now, people who are tortured because of the crimes of the Muslim clerics, the shooting of the Muslim, come out and tell you that I was arrested, I was not given a fair trial, but I was tortured. That mm. have are we have has the Human Rights Commission allowed the government to now use torture as a means to coerce <laughs> people. No, 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 no. Of course, mm -hmm. as a commission, we have always condemned mm. acts of torture. And if you look at our reports, indeed, those are the, the big, actually, it's the, the biggest, if I can say, the biggest human rights violation mm. that we've always uh, noted. Mm. And we've always noted, like mm. in our recent report, the Uganda Police and Uganda People's Defense Forces, was the highest violator yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, of human rights. Yeah. Now, if we go to missing persons, indeed in 2021, uh, the media was awash with so many reports about missing persons. Yeah. And uh, <coughs> we used to read or we noted that they were taken in vans, the so-called uh, drones, to unknown places. Yeah. And um, as a commission, we received uh, 69 complaints. Yeah of alleged enforcement, enforced disappearance. And mm. of course, these matters are still uh, under investigations. <coughs> Do you think there are more than that? 69 seems so little according That's to That's what the... we received as a commission. Okay. But of course, in the media, there were actually many, yeah. th there were many more uh, numbers, mm. Mm. And not only 69. But for us as a commission, we received 69 okay. complaints. And uh, <clears throat> the human rights concerns uh, that were raised, of course, is the arbitrary arrest and detention, where people were taken to even unknown places. Mm -hmm. There were uh, also um, the issue of uh, freedom from torture. Yes. Many people were tortured, yeah. allegedly tortured. Mm -hmm. not, let me not confirm that they were indeed tortured. Mm -hmm. They were allegedly tortured. 
uh, and um, of course uh, they were denied the right to a fair and speedy trial mm. because someone would be taken for months and you even don't know where your person is mm. um, and of course they would not be produced before courts and also the issue of uh, denial to access the outside world because they were taken to different places. They could not get access mm. to their relatives. They could not get access to the outside world. And, and also the issue of uh, limited or no access to healthcare mm. treatment, especially for those that were really tortured. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So as a commission, we, as I told you, we are investigating those cases. And uh, I cannot really give uh, facts on a case that is before tribunal that is before uh, the commission's um, investigations but we hope that uh, once they're out judgments you can see them you can access the judgments on those different issues but as of now what i can confirm is that they are before investigations mm -hmm. they'll go before tribunals for hearing okay let us wait to see the results of that mm -hmm. doctor ah a lot of heat came from people about the silence of the judiciary, mm. the silence of the UL, uh, ULS. It, is seem, it seems that all the human rights lawyers and, you know, people are supposed to be out to condemn and, you know, come together to boycott. Because these are the, um, how can I say, the principles of law i mean why would you become a lawyer if it's not for to seek justice mm. we, we we expect the judiciary to be the one that puts government in check at least the other bodies of the of the government mm. but we only saw uh, that the uganda law society would come out to condemn after a lot of pressure and even when they come out to condemn there is not much that they are saying. There are no way forwards. We expected boycotts. We expected... And now we are seeing also judges have also become part of the, how we, we call it, the junta in mm. the activist <laughs> spaces. We have seen them deny bail for people who have been arrested with no cause. We are up to now, Sejinia, and you know the politicians mm. are still behind bars and they mm. have been behind bars for a long time. The judges have now become part of the system of oppression, you know. So where do we go from here? Or is it a misrepresentation of, of, of uh, events? Mm. Uh, perhaps there is something much more. Mm. Or is maybe the judiciary is not supposed to do that after mm. all, mm. you know. Yeah. I once um, talked to the former Chief Justice of Uganda, um, um, Justice Odoki. Odoki, okay. Yeah, the time he was still sitting Chief Justice. I don't know what human rights issue it was at the time. And we're like, but what are you not, why aren't you coming out? Mm. You know, why aren't you saying something? And it was like, they do a lot behind the scenes. Mm. And I believed him. I believe that different actors do different things. It mm -hmm. may not be the judiciary itself to speak out on certain issues. Mm -hmm. It may have to be civil society or the Uganda Law Society to speak out in different ways. Um, but I believe that different actors must mm -hmm. play different roles. Mm -hmm. I always give this uh, example of the, um, uh, the elephant. If you want to infect an elephant with malaria and kill it eventually, mm -hmm. maybe this elephant is the, the, mal the elephant is the unlawful det detention mm. person <laughs> okay mm, yeah. so if, if you want to defeat it so you must have different mosquitoes biting yeah. mm, mm. one mosquito bites another bites another mm. bites in different places yes. in different ways mm. eventually it will get ill enough yes. Yes. and 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 die mm. gradually <laughs> yes so i believe that um well the judiciary may not be in a place to say much in terms of voicing mm. but of course maybe they can do their role in different ways, you know, at least ensuring the right to bail. Mm -hmm. Of course, mm -hmm. bail is not a right. You have the right to seek. Mm -hmm. But to be given bail, of course, mm -hmm. is subject to certain conditions. Mm -hmm. um, and also, the, the issue of the unlawful detentions, arrests, torture, it's a continuing violation. It's a, it's a continuum. Mm -hmm. You get unlawfully detained. Yeah, the 48-hour rule is, is, uh, is violated. Yes. Mm. Torture is, is, you know, you're subjected to torture. Mm. 
uh, right to a fair trial, no access to family, no access to doctor, no access to mm. lawyer. Mm. It's a whole combination mm. of uh, civil and political rights violations, so which have to be taken uh, very seriously. Um, the School of Law, um, about a week and a half ago, on the 30th of June, mm. we had a symposium on unlawful detentions. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, as I mentioned, that mosquitoes do different things. Mm. For us as academia, we can only do research yes. and advocacy and share the information mm. and hope that then other actors can run with this information. Mm. Um, we call upon other actors you know, to join in on this because it's not something that one, one actor can do alone. How can you support the Human Rights Commission um, I'm for, I mean, for example, we saw um, uh, some weeks back, women politicians were unlawfully detained, mm. you know, and kept in police detention for a while until they were released, I think, on bond or something mm. like that. So it's something that, you know, no one is safe. It can happen mm. to, to people everywhere. Mm. So that's just something that we need to keep talking about. And for me, as someone who still believes that the law works and the mm. court system works, we need to test we need to test the system. We need to bring a case, you know, that tests um, the right to bail, the mm. right to a fair hearing. I think mm. we need to build our jurisprudence. Mm. We may lose some, but one or two will win. So I, mm. I think we still need to push our law to be able to, to work for us mm. Mm, as a country. Do you believe in the argument that uh, the judiciary has been captured? Because uh, people sit and look at, for example, in the case of Kakwenza, even when the signs of torture were there, and even if he was risk, he was clearly everyone could see that he was being threatened. The judge simply refused to give him his passport, mm. you know. And and back to also the issue of bail, you know, for most of these people who have been behind bars, and they have their lawyers come and argue this person has gone beyond the 48 hours, no mm. charges have been brought against them, and the judge will sit there and say that, ah, go back mm. and remind you. Mm. So do you believe with that notion, at least with what people say that the judiciary has been captured? I still believe in the law. I'm a lawyer, <laughs> and I still believe in our constitution because mm. I believe our constitution is a good and strong document. Mm. We can't just throw it away just mm. like that. Mm. Um, for, as I said, I mentioned earlier that I believe the Chief Justice when he said that they are doing something. Mm. They may not be in a position to come out at that very time, but I think we all need to play our role. We need to be, we need to support each other. Mm. Those who can speak out can speak out. The judges may not be able to speak out because of the kind of work that they are doing. Um, so, I, I, you know, you can't sit back and wait for somebody else to do it. What is your role? as mm. a Ugandan, what have you done mm. about mm. this mm. Uh, is something that we need to ask ourselves. So everybody should assess themselves. Mm. But I still believe that the law is there, the constitution mm. is a good one, and we can still use it. Mm. I don't want to say that we, you know, everybody is captured. No, <laughs> we, have to, we have to keep hope alive. Uh, hope. Yes. <laughs> and maybe briefly to add on doctors, as she has, she's uh, talked about her roles. I think Ugandans, we've taken um, the issue of rights. We've really... We talk about rights. It's my right. It's my right. I have a right to do this. Mm -hmm. But we forget the element of the responsibility that we have also mm -hmm. to play mm. uh, on different uh, uh, issues. Yes. Or when we are tackling something, mm. what is our responsibility? As much mm -hmm. as we have a right, but we have a responsibility mm. also that we have to fulfill. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, we do. All of us have to do our little part mm. in this mm. great To so do your mosquito myself. bite. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Mm. Um, there's something that came to me when I did look at all this es escalation of violence, especially with the case of Alexandria. And I don't know, are we nearing whereby the state can use sexual assault as a means to coerce, especially when we're talking about women participating in politics. Mm. Some coin it as the militarization of sexual assault, you know, really for the, uh, the war zones or uh, where really sex is used as a way to subdue your enemy. But 
as you have said, there have only been 69 complaints that have come to you, mm. but there are so many reported in the media, yes. perhaps so many that we don't know. Mm. There are so many people who are unaccounted for, both mm. men and women. And Shahaz is not the only story. I mean, of course, 2021 was really where I think there was a lot more media. You know, social media also has helped a lot in exposing how big the problem is. Mm. You know, so when you're there and by a click of a button, you have, you're there in real time. Mm. You know, you can capture scenes in real time. Yeah, have but you? It's, it's not that, I mean, like, yes, we see mm. that story, but mm. this is not the first time that mm. it's happened. Yes, mm. yeah. Do you remember the Ingrid Trinawa story where yeah. her breasts yeah, were actually, exactly and gross. we could see that. Yes. So it, it has been used mm. for sure. Mm. Maybe social media is now really, you know, making it so prevalent mm. and, you mm. know, uh, but it has, it has been there. But I think for us, we, we should not get tired of talking about it, condemning and mm. bringing action against mm. it. Mm. Yes, of course. Mm. So I'm, I'm going to, to a certain point whereby, so I had reached out to her um, and trying to see how we could help because it was really a concern for me as a woman in politics, as a woman who aspires to, you know, I'm in the opposition, so I'm quite vulnerable. And I thought, well, it cannot be go unanswered, you know. The, at least we have to make some noise about it, make people uncomfortable, even if there are not so many, um, let me say, results after it. But at least when they try it again, you know, there's a little restraint. But what I found um, for me was that everyone seemed to find her body political. Mm. Her it was so, how can I say, we cannot touch her because she is too political, mm. you know. Uh, we cannot touch her because that is a noob issue and therefore the party should be in charge of that, you know. And it's a same, similar thread in all these cases where, especially when the person has been taken in or tortured because of party-related issues or their participation in politics. So it is like when they they are caught up in this political web, they cease to have certain, let me say, certain protections, mm. you get. And it has become a thing for us, even in the populist, you see it, you know, ah, that one, why did you go there also, you know? Mm. Why, why, why were you taking yourself there? Can't you, couldn't you have just sat down and you would have been, you know, you would have mm. been okay? What do you have to say about it? Why do you think it's like that? Because even in civil society, you can see, ah, that thing is too political, I cannot mm. touch it. But there's a real human being behind this politicization. Someone who exercised their right to participate mm. in a political process mm. as a citizen. Mm. And because without doing harm to anyone, just goes out and supports a particular candidate, which legally... Is, is proper and is their right, constitutionally is their right. But then we as a populace are saying to them, well, actually that isn't your right. If you had sat down and done as you were told, you could have had a healthier and safer mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. uh, doctor, you who <laughs> deals yeah. with the legal and yeah. the, the constitutionality and the mm. political. Why is it like that? Because I've also gotten the same from civil society, women's organization. She's too political. We mm. cannot involve The ourselves. feminist slogan. Yeah. Mm. The personal is, polit is political. Mm. Yes. Mm. If it's about my body, my body is not a personal thing. Mm. Mm. It's, a, it's a political thing. It's, it's a public thing. Mm. So somebody must, my rights are political. You know, you can't have rights and say this is a personal matter, this is intimate, it should be dealt with in a, in a private. The way that my body is handled mm. becomes political mm. in itself. It mm. becomes a public mm. uh, issue. Mm. So definitely uh, we need to have voices out there mm. about how her, her person mm. was treated. Mm. We can't put a, a line and say, no, this one you handle it privately. Yeah. Mm. Otherwise mm. then, you know, some rights some you know, bodily autonomy will be pushed under the, yes. the radar and then mm. we'll get more violations against women. Yes. So this is definitely, a, it's a political matter. It's mm. a public issue mm. that must be dealt with within the public arena yes. using mm. the law. Mm. Yeah. Mm. 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 Yeah, yeah, certainly. Mm.
Mm. I mean, human rights are. I, I think I think doctor has said it yeah. all mm. because what was at the back of my mind is that whether you are with for the government or yeah. not for the government, still you're a human being. Yeah, yeah. And your rights should be protected. Mm. Your right, you should be uh, uh, handled in a, in a dignified uh, mm. way. Yeah, in, true. That really uh, portrays your integrity, not mm. that one is nope or whatever. Then mm. you're handled in a certain. Mm. Uh, and professional way and yeah. that's not right whether yeah. for or against still you should be protected how do you think times. we can get that kind of <coughs> i now call it a stigma the, the opposition stigma mm. <laughs> away from um from the populace because i also think they do not understand actually what the what is theirs and mm. how they should be have we reached to a point whereby we think we deserve certain things we think we deserve as ugandans we think we maybe that's why we do not react maybe we think we deserve the way we are being treated mm. have we reached that point it's, unfortunately if we think like that then we have lost mm. our mm. sense of humanity mm. um maybe former, we have former president <laughs> uh, the late uh, madiba yeah nelson mandela said that um, to deny people their human rights is to challenge their very humanity. Mm. If you can't guarantee someone their human rights, regardless of who they are, then we are losing our humanity. Mm. We, we can no longer call ourselves human beings. Yes. Mm. It shouldn't matter who it is. You know, as long as they're not being treated as they should, then all of us mm. are accountable. Mm. If, we, if we sit back and look on, then it is on us. We are the ones who are responsible, actually. So it is on all of us. It, it doesn't matter whether it's a new person or it's mm. a DP person. We should defend their right to do, you know, to enjoy their right. Yeah. Even if we don't agree with what they are saying, yes. we should defend their right to say it yes. because mm. they have a right to do it. Yes. Mm. But otherwise, if we fail to do that as humanity, we have lost out as Ugandans. We are no longer human beings, you know. So I think we need to come out of our spaces and stop being selective. Mm. On that one, we shall come out. Yeah. On that other one, it's a women's issue. We, you know, human rights are human rights, and they are, should be enjoyed by all of us, regardless mm. of our denominations, of our faith, of mm. our genders. Otherwise, we stand to lose out mm. as a country. Mm. Yes, mm. and that, that is a, an uncomfortable place to be heading yes. to. Mm. Yes, yeah. it is mm. very uncomfortable, very mm. scary, mm. I must mm. say, because yes. if people can just watch on as you're being brutalized and tortured True. and be like, ah, yeah. for you, you're too political, you're mm. too what? You deserve it. You, you deserve know? it. Yeah, you right. called it on yourself. Yes, it's like saying because I wear a mini skirt, then someone has the right to True. rape me. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, it it can't be like that. No, True. Mm. It should not. Mm -hmm. Diana, your report also does talk about civil society and the crackdown on civil society. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. You don't remember that part. But during the 2021, at least in the aftermath of the 2021 election, there was mm. a crackdown mm. on civil society. Mm. Did the Human Rights Commission look into that? Yes, but I think it's not specifically this report. Mm -hmm. it must have been, uh, we must have captured it in the elections report. Mm. That's why in this report you did not see anything concerning elections. Mm because we have a special report on, mm, on elections, mm, mm, uh, yeah, mm. which I really can't discuss like now. Oh, okay. Because I have not... Oh, okay, uh, it's okay. Mm. So we can go right to Karamoja, mm. because you also talk about that. Yes. And lately we have been... It, Karamoja has been in the media. Mm. Though I wouldn't say it has been in the mainstream media so much as it has been on social media. There's kind of a cloud around it. We are not sure what is happening. Different people say different things. We are here to disarm. They are, they are different. But let us talk about the extractive um, industries mm. because perhaps that is the cause of all this um, chaos that we are seeing there. Mm. And, you know... Recently, we have heard that there is gold in Karamoja. Mm. There are all sorts of minerals in Karamoja. People are going there. They're in mines mm. and they are digging. So tell us 
about that for people who don't seem to get any clear information about Karamoja, how mm. is the extractive um, industries affecting human rights of the Karamojong people? Okay. Now, um, as you mentioned, indeed, Karamoja is um, blessed with so many minerals, around 58 minerals mm, wow. are found in Karamoja, like copper, iron, uh, limestone, cobalt, nickel. There are so many. And of course, um, there's a lot of mining that is mining that is taking place in Karamoja. Mm. And, uh, you know, any um, good thing normally comes with also the bad side of it. Mm. So the mining industry or the mining, mining sector in Karamoja uh, has brought about so many human rights concerns that we looked at as a condition. One is on child labor. We found out that many children were being uh, were working in the mines. Mm. 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 They're working in mines as a, a, a and of course most of them were not going to school. If you're working in a mine, then the right to education you forego it. Mm. So most of them are really working in mines, and uh, the issue of lack of protective gear, and most especially those people you would find them with big wounds. Maybe yeah, because of the of exposure course. that they have got oh. from the from most especially those in marble queries, yeah. they get accidents, they get wounds, the unhealing wounds. Um, also, the issue of uh, lack of contracts. People work mm, without contracts. Mm, 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 mm. They do not know their pay. Mm. It's determined at the end of the month. You, mm. I should give you seven thousand mm. or something, but they do not have contracts. Mm. And so we also mentioned uh, that, of course, they are being exploited yeah. uh, uh, in one way or another. If you do not have a contract, you don't know what you're working for, you don't know your pay, you don't know your terms and conditions in that contract. Uh, we also looked at the issue of inadequate community consultations. And maybe this, if I uh, target to the women, you know, most women were not really engaged in these community consultations. Mm. And uh, on issues of land, you know, uh, that uh, land in Karamoja is communally owned. Yes, yes, so yes. women really have little or no say mm, mm, on what yes, takes place yes. on this kind of land. Yeah. It's a patriarchal society. society yeah, yeah. So you really find that they are not really participating. Mm. Yet they are the people or they are uh, the ones that would be providing food or that are in charge of providing food for mm. their families. Mm. So we also see the issue of, of Famine and hunger, yeah, yeah. Uh, issue of uh, lack of water, uh, because most of those uh, areas were taken as mines and accessing them is also really hard. So there are quite a number of disturbing issues mm. if you go to Karamoja. Uh, and of course, um, as a commission, we are really concerned. Mm. We monitored and we gave our findings, we gave our uh, recommendations. On to, to parliament on what should be done mm. um, and from looking at it mm. from a, a holistic perspective you really see that any project mm. should really be people centered mm. they should consider people they should look at people first not at what am I be going to get out of there so we we feel that uh, the mining industry or the extractive um, uh, industries there are not really people-centered. They are looking at what can we get out of Karamoja. Mm. But we are not looking at the impact of mining, impact to the people, to the animals. You know, they, are, they, are, they, 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 they have cows, they are, mm. they are pastorists. So most of their cows actually are also dying because they do not have uh, a, a pasture. The land was taken. So those are the issues that we really found out and they are yes. quite disturbing. Karamoja's issues are quite disturbing. Mm. But also, did you, in, during your report, did, were you able to investigate why um, why the, there seems to be an influx of children coming in? Coming in to, to... Into, into the city from that particular area? No, did you we did not really that? look at it in this okay. annual, specifically look at it in this mm -hmm. annual report. Mm -hmm. uh, but we know, we know the reasons as to why they come. Mm -hmm. Poverty. Mm -hmm. They are poor. They don't have food. Mm -hmm. 
So why should they keep there? Even there's someone who has gone to Kampala. When that person goes back, they look at them as if they are angels from, you know, heaven. Yeah. So mm. they, they, they also sort of like pull them to, to come to, to Kampala. Okay. Okay. And the whole issue is on poverty, the whole issue is on hunger, people are really starving, they don't have food, children are dying. Mm. So really, true. Mm. Doctor, mm. Um, perhaps with also your closing remarks, mm. um, would you give us, why, why is it that we are not able to regulate the extractive um, um, industry? Why is it that we are not, because we are always seeing children crushing stones, mm. um, all over that, it's not only in Karamoja. Yeah, I think yesterday mm. on the there was a report of a child who had to drop out of school and you know she's in. But also, where are the mining laws, you know, mm. what is going on? Mm. Briefly, together yeah. with your closing remarks, because we are, mm. we are short out of time. Mm. The first time I went to Karamoja, the first word I learned, the first Karmajong word I learned is akoro. Mm. Everywhere I would pass, akoro, hunger. Mm. Mm. You know, that says something yeah. about a community. Yeah. What is happening to this community? But if you look at the extractives industry, um, I think it re re reinforces the traditional gender roles in society and the, in the Karmajong society. If you look at the gold mining, I don't know whether you've ever observed that process yeah, yeah, of yeah. sifting yes, the, yes. The, in the gold in Where the water. It is the for, ladies yeah. who are doing it mm. with the young women. Mm. The men are seated somewhere in a tree mm. waiting to see how much has been gotten and then they'll go and sell it. Mm. When For the marble crushing, it's the men who are doing the crushing. Mm. The women are bringing firewood because they have to hit the stone for mm. it to be able to crack. Mm. So still the women are playing a supportive role. Mm. The men are the ones, you know, doing the other work. But at the end of the day, they are going to be paid. It's the men who handle the cash. Mm. Sometimes they even pay in alcohol. Mm. So, wow. Yes, how much alcohol at the end wow. of the day? <laughs> what they, is the use of it? So, you know, where are the women in yeah. all this? Yeah. Participation of women, um, the family security, food security. All those are issues that need to be thought about. The extractives industry needs to be regulated better. Um, I think we need to do proper assessments before we start these initiatives. What are the gender assessments of the area? What is it that we need to be doing? Mm. But also as a country, where are the interests of the citizens? Mm. So much about investors and, and income and taxes, but we need to put the citizen of Uganda back mm. at mm. the center of Uganda. People mm. need to own this country, mm. you know? Laws need to work for the Ugandan before we can think about other people coming in to develop us. We need to think about ourselves. Okay. Yes. Mm. Diana, your closing remarks? Mm. Uh, thank you. And uh, as we come to the end of the show, I would like to state that when given an opportunity, please speak. Speak about the women. Speak about their rights. Because you are in a better position to say what my mother in the village would not be able to yeah. say. You have uh, space for you to, to, to really air out your views. So given an opportunity, let's speak. And of course, as a, the Uganda Human Rights Commission, we are still committed to uh, protection and promotion of all people's rights as a constitutional mandate. We are, we are not tired. We are ready and willing to continue to protect the rights of all persons in the country. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to my panelists. So you have it there, viewers, and please remember what we have just said. Your humanity and the humanity of others are important. You mm. do not, if you do not value someone's humanity, then you are at risk of yours being taken away. Mm. So that is it for today. Catch us again this time next week on the women's show here on civic space tv bye